I've come a long way. It's a 17-hour flight. I'm not from here. You may not have guessed by the accent, but um, I live in South Africa. I've been uh, married 25 years this year, last year, sorry, and uh, I have two children. And my daughter, Emily, is now 22. That's not my breakfast. That's something in the... <laughs> my daughter now is 22 years old, and uh, she's still single. And so any young eligible man here <laughs> can speak to me afterwards. The bride price in Africa is 22 cows, so <laughs> we can negotiate. My son, Kyle, is in university. He's studying mechanical engineering. And... Uh, Fascinating, I got a, a text from him while I was traveling now, and they're busy developing a drone, an automated drone with facial recognition and all kinds of software to um, hunt down people that are hunting rhinos in South Africa. And so um, he's, he's learning to, to be an engineer. He's my pension plan. I'm hoping he's going to make lots of money, <laughs> and uh, I'll be able to retire comfortably. I'm just such a privilege to be here with you guys this morning. As uh, Ben said, I have the privilege of traveling around the world, and it's not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. It's just hours and hours in airplanes and airports. Uh, people say to me, where do I live? I say, in an airplane, and I visit South Africa occasionally. <laughs> and um, about 15 years ago, I went through a major, major change in ministry. I've been in ministry for 30 years. And about 15 years ago, I got to a place where I was highly frustrated with what I was seeing. I was, uh, every morning I would wake up and I would put all my energy into ministry and, and do everything that I could, work extremely hard. But every evening I'd go to bed and I'd wonder if the work that I was doing and the energy that I was putting in was actually yielding the kind of results that I see in the book of Acts. And for 30 years, I've been pursuing and chasing and saying, God, can we see something like the book of Acts in our day and age? I, I was just so desperate. And I, I had come to a place that I was extremely desperate. I, was, uh, I had planted five churches. I was planting the, the fifth one that was about the size. And, and the one Sunday morning, I remember waking up and turning to my wife, and I said to her, something is wrong. She stopped and she said, what's wrong, what's wrong? She thought someone was in the house and, and something was wrong around us. And I said, no, something is horribly wrong inside here. And she said, she, she said what's going on? And I said, I, I, I don't know, but, but something is stirring in me and, and something needs to change. By all accounts, we were actually relatively successful. We were on the fifth church plant. It was growing. We were looking for property. And uh, I, I was, I, you know, everybody around would look at it and say, hey, you're doing well, keep going. And yet something was, was, was irritating me. I went to church that morning. And as I was standing in the front like this, talking to a group of people, my mind left the building. Now, that might surprise you that sometimes your pastor's mind leaves the building when he's talking to you. But it actually, <laughs> it actually happens. And and so I was talking. I have no idea what I preached that morning. I'm sure it was a good sermon. But my, my mind left the building. And I went up and I looked down and, and kind of went up higher and higher and higher. And I looked down. And, and where I live is an area called Midrand. Midrand is an, an area that was developed between two cities. How many of you heard of Johannesburg? How many of you heard of Pretoria? I mean, have you been to Johannesburg and Pretoria? There's some people here. Great stuff. So where I live is where these two cities have merged together. And so I was standing and talking to a group of people. And as I was talking, my mind left the building. And I, and I looked down. And I looked down on the building we were in. And then I went up higher. And I eventually looked down on the entire city. And as I'm talking, I've, I'm, I'm having this experience, and I look down on the city, and I ask myself a question I had never asked before. I ask, what would it actually take to reach a city? At that stage, I was surrounded by 10 million people. Today, it's 14.5 million people. And I asked, what would it actually take? 
And I had a, 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 an encounter with the Lord that changed my life because I realized in that moment in time that everything that I was doing in cultural Christianity was not going to take me to where God was stirring me to go. God was calling us to reach cities and to reach nations. And what I was, what I was doing was not going to get us there. And so I went through a, an inner conflict and turmoil, and, and I remember <laughs> taking the next day and going away on leave for a few days and, and praying about it, and God was just stirring things in me. We drove about six hours from where we stay, and we stopped at the coast, and I remember getting out the car and saying to my wife, I, I'm in such a bad place. Something is just really going on. I'm just so irritated and frustrated take the children and, and go into the home where we're staying for the next few days. I'm, I'm going for a walk, and I turned around. I didn't close the car door, and I walked into the street, and I just began walking down one street after the other. And I said, God, if something, if you don't speak to me, if something doesn't happen, then I, I think I'm going to leave ministry. Now, it might, be, it might kind of surprise you that somebody in ministry is saying that, but I was, I was so crying out to God. And as I walked down, the Lord showed me that what he wanted me to do. And then I started to argue. How many of you ever argued with God? Anybody? Hands up. How many ever won the argument? <laughs> the hands down went down very quickly. <laughs> well, I walked up and down and, you know, my arguments were, God, what you're telling me to do, nobody's done before. That wasn't actually true, but in my experience, I hadn't seen anybody do what God had told, was telling me to do. It, I said, God, what you're telling me to do will cause me to be rejected by my friends, my family, all the people I went to seminary with, they will all call me crazy. And that actually, actually happened for a while. I said, God, what, what you're telling me to do has no income attached to it. How am I going to provide for my family? I said, God, I, I can't do this. And heaven was silent. I love, you know the one thing I love about this church? I mean, there's, there's a few things I love about just walking in here this morning. How, how diverse you guys are, but also how young you guys are. And I, I just love that. And I want to encourage you that that when God begins to speak to your heart, there are people in here that he might, he might stir and he might be calling you to do something that nobody around you has ever done. That you can't, you can't see an example of it being done before. Here's the thing. If the church in its current form was going to get the job done, we would have been there already. 100 years ago, the world was 33% Christian. Guess what we are today? 33% Christian. Globally, we have stagnated. If what we're doing right now was going to get the job done, we would have gotten there already. At the rate that the church multiplied in the book of Acts, if that continued, we would have won the world in 30 years. But something went wrong. And so I started saying, God, I, I, I can't do this. I won't do this. I, and by the time I went back, I'd lost the argument. Some of the things that the Lord started to take me to were, were how to make disciples. He showed me how so, so often we, we build churches and we build great successful churches, but we don't build followers of Jesus. We measure success by how many people are in a building rather than how many people are following Jesus and impacting a society. And it's not either or, but really we are so heavy on measuring success by the wrong thing. And so I took a year and I transitioned out of that church that I had started. And I went on a, a journey. Now here's the thing. When you obey God, things don't always go well. So the next year, I remember um, I went in, I just lost my way. 
my wife went into a deep, deep depression. And, and for nine months, we, just were, we were in a very dark place. And I sat at home every day, and I was just complaining of God. Anyone done that before? Am I the only person? Yeah, it's somebody, somebody else. I was complaining. You know. I remember us sitting one day, my wife and I, out on the stoop or the veranda or the porch. Or what do you guys call it? One of those. And, you know, South Africa is a British colony, so we drink hot tea. So we were sitting and we were drinking hot tea, my wife and I, and we were having a good complaining sit. I mean, life was bad, life was miserable, things weren't going well, and it was all God's fault. Anyone, anyone been there? Maybe some of you are there right now. And it was all God's fault. And as we sat there and we had a conversation, God showed up. We weren't having a prayer meeting, we were complaining. But God showed up. He doesn't just show up at prayer meetings, and He doesn't just show up at church services. And so he showed up, and he began to confront me. He showed me how my entire significance all my life had been in my position as a pastor, my position as a leader, who I was. If I wasn't on stage, I was nothing. You know, I was nobody in my own eyes. And God broke me and took me back to, to realize that who I was in him I woke up the next morning and I, and I said, God, we've got to now do what you told us to do. And so I, I began to, to say, what, 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 what is it, what is it that, that I must do? And God had spoken one word to me. He would said, I want you to build movements of the gospel. I had no idea what that was. None. But I thought, well, the first part of movement is move, so I'm going to get in an airplane. So I began to book airplane seats and just fly to random cities without knowing anybody in the city. Because I thought, I'm just going to move. And so I got in the one airplane and flew to a city about two hours from where I stay, Cape Town, and landed, walked out the airport, and I thought, you know, all heaven was going to show up. Angels were going to greet me. Ah! And I walked in, and there was nothing. And I walked up and down the airport, and, I, and I, after two, three hours, I thought, this is, this is crazy. I've lost my mind. So I went to a coffee shop, and I sat down to book my ticket to fly back again. And as I opened my computer, there was a random email from someone in the city. And they'd left their phone number. And so I called him. And I said, oh, by the way, I'm in Cape Town. I need a ride from the airport. Oh, and I'm sleeping at your house tonight. <laughs> And just out of simple obedience and, and, and just doing what God told us to do, a movement started. We started one small group and we began to make disciples. We began to help them to follow Jesus. And then we flew to another place and we did the same thing. And then we flew to another place. And then those groups began to multiply into other groups and churches started to form. And, and in the next four years, Four and a half, sorry, three and a half thousand churches started in eight different countries that I didn't do. I was just a crazy guy that believed that God wanted to do something different and was willing to obey. God doesn't use intelligence and great giftedness and the ability to speak well as much as he uses Simple obedience. And he calls us all to simple obedience. And so this movement started that, that today spans all over the world. And, and in a wild ride, God took me to, to Russia. And in 16 countries across Eurasia, we saw 4,500 churches start in the next four years. And then we began to see, we asked God, what, can we, what do we do next? And, and he laid the cities of the world in our heart. And so today... I help um, churches and organizations uh, and leaders to build these kinds of movements all over the world. But I want to tell you that it, it, it's, it's really about simple obedience. 
Here's the number one thing I've learned. God uses remarkably ordinary people to do remarkably extraordinary things. And I am remarkably ordinary. So I want to talk to you this morning just briefly about a, a, a context. I'm going to go to a scripture, but I've called the message when 400 families uh, move into your backyard. When 400 families move into your backyard. And I'm going to show you how it's not just a theoretical story, but it's something that actually happened to me and, and how Jesus causes, calls us to respond. But I want you to turn to um, Luke chapter 10, and I think we'll probably put it up on the screen. But Luke chapter 10, verse 25, and it's a story that you're very familiar with, but I want to draw one or two things, lessons from it this morning. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Now notice here, he's testing Jesus. He's not just asking a question. Most people that ask you questions are testing you. They, they, they're, they're actually wanting a particular answer from you. And this guy wants a particular answer for Jesus, and he's testing him to see if he's going to give the answer that he wants Jesus to give. And I think we find ourselves increasingly, you know, I've been coming to the United States for 10 years now, about four times a year. And so I'm pretty familiar with the culture here. And, and over that time, I've watched the culture become increasingly hostile towards Christianity. And Jesus here is in a hostile situation. So it's, it's really important for us to, to, to look at what does Jesus do when someone challenges him with a really difficult question. Some of you students here and you're, you're on campus, people are going to ask you very difficult questions. They're going to challenge you. What does Jesus do? Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit internal, eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. <laughs> so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down for, from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went, went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on to the, by the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, when he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man down on his donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Just for one minute, why don't you turn to somebody and, and, and share with them what do you get from this, what do you get from this scripture? What do you think is the main point of this scripture? Just turn to somebody quickly. What's the main point of this passage? Okay, I want to I give you just a couple of pointers here on how Jesus teaches us to make disciples 
And then we're going to talk about the parish passage just briefly, and we're going to try and do those two things in five minutes each. And so stay with me. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna race ahead here. So Jesus teaches us to make disciples. One of the mistakes that we make when we read Scripture is we read so much into what Jesus says that we don't read so much uh, enough into what Jesus does. What is Jesus doing here? And, and I want to start with that just briefly, quickly. Number one, he answers the question with a question. One of the most important things you can learn about making disciples is learn to answer questions with questions. You know, we think that we've got to be the answer man. We think we've got to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. Here's the Son of God. He has all the answers, and He refuses to give the answers. He answers a question with a question. Number two, He points people to Scripture and allows them to discover the truth. Jesus says, so what does the Scripture say? What does the Bible say about this? And allows people to explore and to, to discover, to wrestle with truth. <coughs> Sorry. I found the most powerful way to make disciples is to give people sleepless nights by refusing to answer the question, by getting them to wrestle with the answer at night, by pointing them to Scripture and asking them, so what do you think this says? Number three, he affirms people he, he affirms what, what the guy discovers. Here's the, th the, the third way that we can make disciples very effectively is by affirming what people discover for themselves as God speaks to their heart. What, you, what you've said is very right. That's true. Go and do that. But you see, it's not enough for this guy because he's been confronted with truth. So, so he's going to say, but, but, but Jesus, <laughs> but, but what if? And what we find here is a, a discussion, a relationship, and Jesus is refusing to be the answer man to all the questions. What we found is that the most effective way to make disciples is to refuse to be the answer man. Answer questions with questions. Point people at Scripture and ask them, what does this say? Affirm what people are discovering. Take them on a journey. Fourthly, tell stories and speak in parables. Jesus does that. Even when the man comes back and he, he says, but, but, but Jesus, and he gives, gives him a response, Jesus does not come back with an answer. He tells a story. He goes around about, and the story illustrates and exposes the man's heart. And fifthly, challenge people towards obedience. Jesus looks at him in the end and he says, you go and do Likewise, all of our discipleship is useless if it's about knowledge and not about application. And so challenge people to go and do likewise. So back in 2008, I was driving down the road close to my house. And there were a crowd of people on an open piece of property. It was right next to my house, just about two or three plots from my house. It was virtually my backyard. And there were 400 families standing on an open piece of bush. And they were foreigners in the city that had been chased out of their homes. And suddenly I found myself in a situation where I was trying to help refugees on my own backyard to build and to find homes with the United Nations and tents and, and trying to create sewerage and running water and, and all kinds of you know, challenges that we were facing. And I saw this situation firsthand because I watched one person after another drive past Look the other way. Look at these people that were struggling and desperate and, and, and instead of responding, instead of stepping out and saying, what can I do? Their first thought was, how can I protect myself? How can I keep these people at distance from myself? How can I ignore this problem? How can I drive past? 
This wasn't about politics. This was about a real situation that we were facing right where we lived. And for five months, I had to stop everything that I did. And I had to help 400 families relocate and find homes. And this story became extremely real to me. Extremely real. It wasn't just theory anymore. I was facing the reality every single day of having to live this story. Every single day I was facing the reality of not going to work, not earning an income, not doing the things that I would normally do to go and help 400 families find food, lodging, and water. And as I looked through this passage during that time, God stirred in me something that was very instrumental to birthing the movements that we see around the world today. Here's a couple of principles that I get from that passage, and then we're going to close. And I'm just going to leave you with some seeds this morning. Number one, I believe the story tells us that loving my neighbor will take me outside of my comfort zone. This, young, this man that comes to Jesus, he challenges Jesus because he wants to go, you know, when the Bible says love my neighbor, when, when the Old Testament says love my neighbor, surely he means my friend. Surely he means people that are just like me. Surely he means somebody that I really get on with. Surely Jesus doesn't mean people that I don't know. Surely this passage is not talking about people that are different to me. It can't possibly be talking about Samaritans. This passage teaches me that loving my neighbor is going to take me outside of my comfort zone. If we want to reach cities, we have to come face to face with a reality that cities are incredibly diverse. And that God calls us to reach that diversity. And it breaks my heart. That's why I love sitting here this morning. It breaks my heart as I go to one church after the other that does not reflect the diversity of their city. Number two, the kingdom of God moves towards brokenness. If you want to see the kingdom come, step into brokenness. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus gives his manifesto and he says, the, the spirit of God is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, the broken, the hurting, the prisoner, the sick, the bound. The kingdom of God moves towards brokenness. In our tendency our, is to move towards comfort the great American dream, right? I'm going to make all the money that I can and then build something that can, where I can hide from people. I can get in my car, never have to speak to anybody, stop in my yacht, be alone in my yacht on the sea, and I've arrived. And Jesus gives the opposite here. He says, guys, life, life comes when we move towards brokenness. You want to see the kingdom come, step into brokenness. Thirdly, God works through the least likely people to accomplish the extraordinary. I have learned that God uses remarkably ordinary people. And our disciple makers and leaders are so incredibly diverse and ordinary. My oldest disciple maker is a lady that's illiterate and 95 years old. My youngest disciple is eight years old, and she makes disciples with her friends in a gang-ridden area that I'm scared to walk through. God just works through the most remarkably ordinary people. And, and that's, I, I enjoy that. You see, we've built a culture in the 